Okay, good morning. Uh, I am not Will Thiessen. Um, um, it's, first of all, thank you so much to Nancy and Adarshia for the invitation. Uh, it's been a great privilege uh, to work with Will over the last um, six years now, uh, working on personality and whole trade theory, and specifically the question of uh, relating whole trade theory to the question of virtue. And over the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we would like to give you an overview of whole trade theory and make the argument that whole trade theory can be helpful in understanding uh, the nature of virtue from an empirical standpoint. Um, I am the latest in a long line of collaborators that, that, collaborators that Will has had. And um, we'd like to thank those, co those collaborators. Um, we also want to thank our funders, both the NIH and the Templeton Religion Trust. So, over the last 50 years or so, the science of personality has made great strides in understanding human behavior. Uh, for example, the model of the Big Five has done an excellent job, at least in our view, of of um, describing human behavior. Now, what we need now, at least in our view, is a model that of, is a model of traits that can do a number of specific tasks. For one, a model of traits needs to describe what people do in their everyday lives. A model also needs to, ex ex also needs to explain how these traits work in people. This model also needs to explain how traits relate to self-motivation and belief. So for example, I think maybe a year or 18 months ago, there was a white paper related to this project that was circulated. And I think one of the claims in the paper was that self and motivation were distinct from traits. Um, our view is that self and motivation can be integrated into understanding of traits. And that's one view, that's the view that we'll uh, argue for in this presentation. Fourth, traits, among other things, argue for the stability of behavior. But it's also true that people vary in behavior. So a model of traits needs to respond to the claims of situationism. So in the 1960s, there was a big debate about situationism that was driven in part by the work of uh, psychologists like Walter Michel. Now, that debate has largely gone away in uh, uh, psychology, although you know, it turns out that it, keems, it seems to come up every 25 years or so, uh, like, you know, like a disease that doesn't quite go away. But um, <laughs> it's also a debate that recently reared its head in moral philosophy through the work of Gil Harman, John Doris, Owen Flanagan, and other philosophers. And it's an important question, because intuitively it seems that even though people do as it turns out, differ in meaningful ways. It also seems to be the case that people vary from moment to moment in their behavior. And moreover, there's empirical research in social psychology that seems to back up these intuitions. Moreover, the claims of situationism are particularly worrisome when we look at the question of morality. So the social psychology experiments such as the Good Samaritan experiment that John Daly ran, uh, the experiment with the, di with the dimes in the phone booth that Alice Eisen ran. These are all studies that are relevant to moral behavior. And they showed that situational cues seem to pr be a stronger predictor of moral behavior in a way that seemed problematic for the case of virtue. So these are questions that a model of trait model of traits needs to address, at least in our view. So what's at stake here? If a model of traits isn't able to address these five questions, what's at stake for our ability to talk meaningfully about virtue? If, we're, if a model of traits isn't <coughs> able to talk about, isn't able to address these questions, it is not possible to talk about differences in character in a meaningful way. 
it would not be possible for us to claim that virtue ethics is psychologically plausible. We would not be able to argue that people's character could be developed over time. Right? And the work that most institutions do to develop character in children, in young adults, would be moot. So this is a question that has important theoretical, academic, and real world implications. Okay, so now that I've laid out the importance of having a coherent model of traits, let me walk through a number of steps about, if from our perspective, what traits are and what they describe. So when you fill out a questionnaire, right? When you're answering a questionnaire about, you know, what type of person you are, how you, how you rank, you, how you rate yourself on a questionnaire that assesses your personality, that assesses your personality on a certain set of traits, like the Big Five, for example. What is that questionnaire describing about you? When we ask people about their personality, we are asking people about what they do in their daily lives. So, in our research, when we ask people about how they enact, how they behave in their daily life, we typically assess their personality through what we call a personality state. Now, many of you, if you've ever taken, so how many of you have taken a personality measure? Okay, all of you know what I'm talking about. Most, almost all of you know what I'm talking about. So typically, a personality measure would ask you, so for example, if you're extroverted, you might ha have to answer a question, uh, you know, I like, I typically enjoy myself at parties, right? So if I want to know, if I want to ask you about your personality state, I will ask you about the extent to which you're engaging, is, you've engaged in a social situation in the last 15 minutes. In other words, I take the content of that trait questionnaire and I use it to assess your behavior over a much shorter period of time. In other words, we assess the personality that you're having right now. And the reason why we do this is that our personalities or the personalities we enact over the course of a day, over the course of a week, vary substantially. So for example, if we look at this random individual, his behavior over the course of the day, over the course of the week, can change depending on the context that he's in, depending on the social situation that he's in, and depending on the tasks that he has to achieve. How we do this typically is through experience sampling. What we do is that we track people for around 9 to 14 days and five times a day, we'll assess them using an iPhone. Right? So if you have a smartphone, we'll send you a message five times a day asking you maybe 10 to 14 questions about what you're doing right now and how you've been feeling for the last 15 minutes. So how talkative have you been? How bold have you been? How energetic have you been? And that way, we get a sense of how people's personalities change and vary from moment to moment. And this is research that I've done for the last four, uh, six or seven years. This is research that Will has done for the last 20 years or so. <laughs> so what do we know from this research? One thing we know is, to some extent, this the situationists are right. People's personalities vary from moment to moment. So this is a graph depicting the, style de the extent to which people vary on, the ex on their extroversion. So it turns out that they people, this if you look at the standard deviation uh, of people's extroversion, a lot of people vary pretty significantly when it comes to their extroversion. Some people vary a little bit, some people vary a lot, 
But on average, there is a fair bit of variability on people with extroversion. OK. This is a graph looking at the between-person variability of the big five. Right? So these are the big five traits that describe people's social behavior. And that's the within-person variability. So I want to give you the argument that this is, these are large standard deviations. So in order to do that, I'm going to compare these within-person standard deviations to the within-person standard deviations for affect, right? Because most of you would agree that our affect changes from moment to moment, right? People's affect tends to go up and down. So when we compare people's within-person variability to that of affect, you see that it's pretty comparable. So people's personalities vary from moment to moment just as much as their positive and negative affect. Uh, those are the standard deviations. Another way of doing this is to compare the within-person variabil uh, uh, variability with the within <coughs> with their between-person variability. So the extent to which they, they differ from other people compared to the extent to which they differ from themselves. And what you find is for pretty much all the traits, they differ from themselves more than they actually differ from other people. So, so far we know that people do vary significantly. But we also know that if you look at their average extroversion or their average trait levels across a period of time. So remember, I told you, typically you run these studies over 9 to 14 days. It turns out people do differ from each other when you look at their mean levels. So this is a graph looking at the average or mean extroversion across two weeks. And it turns out that people do have different mean levels. Right? So these are the number of participants who have different levels of extroversion. Moreover, if you correlate people's average levels of extroversion in one week with their average extroversion in a second week, the correlations between those two numbers are extremely high. So for example, let me, let's see if I can use this. This is an in these are these dots are individuals. This individual, his average extroversion in the first week was close to a five, and his extroversion in the second week was also close to a five. And these are this is reflected in the correlations, which are extremely high. You typically don't get correlations this high in psychology. So it turns out that people are ex people's people's personalities are remarkably consistent over a two-week period. So what does this mean? This means that situationism is, to some extent, correct. People's, people's behavior does vary from moment to moment. But at the same time, if you look at people's behavior over time, people exhibit very, really strong consistency. So one question we need to address is why do people change so much? Now, one possible response, right, and I'm sure some of you have thought this, is that maybe the reason why people are, are consistent over multiple situations is because they select into the same situations over time, right? So it might be that the reason why people are consistent over a two-week period is not because of some feature within the person, 
but because they happen to be in the same situations over multiple period, over a long period of time. It turns out you can address that question by doing experience study, experience something study in the laboratory. And the advantage of that is that you can actually place people in the same situations over and over again to see whether the extent to which people exhibit consistency in their behavior is because of the situation or because of features within the person. And what we, what we found here <coughs> is that people did in fact have different means even in the same situation. And moreover, the consistency in their behavior was because of features within the, within the person and not because of the situation. So, just to summarize, when it comes to describing people's behavior, it makes sense to talk about people's behavior in terms of a distribution of their behavior. So for example, if we think of someone who's high in conscientious, conscientiousness, it makes sense to think about them as, uh, uh, think about their behavior as a distribution of conscientious relevant behavior. So this is, what, this is what it means to call someone conscientious. Similarly, if someone is low in conscientiousness or unconscientious, this is what it means to call someone unconscientious. So, this is a description of someone's trait relevant behavior. The next step is explaining why people have these distributions, right? So people behave, we know that people behave in this way. Why do people behave in this way? So we need to get a question of mechanisms. So we need to explain why people have these, distribu di these distributions. And we also need to get it at the etiology to explain why, why people have different trait distributions. And in order to answer that question, I'm going to turn to my colleague. Thanks, Rhonda. Well, I'm going to stand up here. Can everybody hear me fine back there? You got good. OK, great. Uh, so this theory, uh, when Rhonda came to work with me uh, as a postdoc, actually, before he was a professor, uh, the theory was sort of in this nascent, latent, unreal point where it's almost there, but not quite there. And what Iran and I have done together is, is realize the theory and make it an actual theory. And we've done this it, simultaneously in the context of normal traits, just regular old traits like extroversion and conscientiousness, and in the context of, of the virtues. So we're doing it at the same time. So it, most of our papers, we sort of alternate first authors on these papers. That's why we're <coughs> presenting this together. So today, you saw that Aranda talked about traits as descriptions. How, what are traits describing in people? What is it about people that are traits describing? You say someone's extroverted, you say someone's conscientious, what are you describing? And so you're describing a distribution and where it is on that uh, dimension of the trait that you're talking about. And so what I'm going to talk about now is, is the explanatory part. <laughs> um, the, uh, so I'm going to talk about well, where, what is the cause of those distributions, the second part of the whole trait theory. The key starting point for this, there's two key starting points. The first one is, a, is an assumption that I will give you some data relevant to in a second. And that assumption is, is that states have consequences. When you act in a certain way, when you're talkative, it has a consequence on the world. It makes the world different. People have to listen to you or ignore you. People might change their mind. If you're t silent, that will have a different consequence on the world. So how you're acting has a, makes a difference to the world, has consequences. The second key point, starting point here is that states change rapidly over time, as Rhonda just showed you. So what that means is that <coughs> people are constantly changing which states they have, and these states are having consequences in the world. So it just stands to reason, therefore, that if, if, that if the states are having consequences and they're changing constantly, people should be, and probably are, using those states in order to achieve the consequences they want. The traits are these intentional uh, entities where people are using them in order to accomplish certain consequences. That's in a nutshell, come back to that later. <laughs> so let me, <laughs> let me start with um, one consequence. 
to just show you that states do have consequences. It's well known that extroverts have more positive affect than introverts. I always say hap are happier than introverts, but fortunately Valerie's right in front of me to make sure I don't make that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so extroverts have more positive affect than introverts. Well known, it's been known for decades. My question was, well, if that is true at the trait level, that extroverts are happier or have more positive affect than introverts, then the question I, I was wondering about is, well, can, is that really because of the states that people are enacting? If you act extroverted, does that create happiness in the moment or positive affect in the moment? So that was the question. And it seems like that wouldn't happen, right? That seems impossible, right? It's who you are that, that makes you happy, right? It's not what you're doing. And anyway, if you, if you were an introvert prete pretending to be a extroverted, that wouldn't be real. That would just be faking or something. And introverts, you know, we like to take a bath and read a book. That's what we like to do for fun. We get our kicks in different ways than those extroverts. And then finally, it's just, it can't be that simple to just become happier by just acting in a different way. So we did an experiment. We had people come in groups of three and they were instructed in one condition, act bold, talkative, energetic, active, assertive, and adventurous. In the other condition, they were randomly assigned a condition. We have told them act, reserve, quiet, lethargic, passive, compliant, unadventurous. Talk to each other for 10 minutes. At the end of the 10 minutes, we said, well, how much fun was that? How much fun was that conversation? And what we find is huge differences. The white bars, people who were instructed to act extroverted, the, the open bars, the bar that was the people who were acted to, instructed to act introverted, and you find this basically two standard deviation differences, which is a gigantic effect. Um, this massive difference, they're just for 10 minutes, they're like, love it. And it turns out you get the same difference for dispositional introverts as you do for dispositional extroverts. There's no difference in what your sort of average way of being is and the effect that you get. Although it's interesting, oh, let me just point out, please don't, this is not an instruction that people should be, become extroverts, <laughs> right? There's not, we don't want a bunch of people running around being extroverted all the time. This is, and, and also it's probably dangerous, right? Being extroverted means being, at, you know, adventurous and bold and assertive. There are lots of times you don't want to be doing those things, like for example, when you want to get something done or you don't want to make people angry or something. So this is only for if you're in a situation where you'd like some more positive affect, this is a really simple, easy way to get it. So, uh, well I skipped the slide. We also, we also did it, by the way, we did this, we, uh, someone else repeated this experiment, John Zelensky in Canada, and he uh, repeated the experiment where he said, okay, here's the instructions, exact same instructions I showed you, and he said, uh, how is this going to make you feel if you do this? And the extrovert said, oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be fun. And the introvert said, oh, my God, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> and so then they did it. And then 10 minutes later, he said, okay, you still thought that was going to be terrible. How was it actually? And the introvert said, actually, that was pretty fun. So they, 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 it's this, it's this a, a, a affective forecasting error, I think, that is involved in this uh, circumstance. This, uh, I wanted to show that you can really account for all of the relationship between, you know, like questionnaire or dispositional extroversion and questionnaire positive affect by how much extroversion you actually enact. So, for in fact, it turns out that the correlation between questionnaire extroversion and questionnaire positive affect drops to non-significance. There's no relationship between trait extroversion and trait happiness or trait positive affect when you take into account how people actually act. So what it's, it's the way you act, it's the state that has the consequences. So if states have consequences, and states are so variable, as Irana showed you, then uh, do people enact states when they have a goal for which the state is suited, right? Is that what, that's what, that what states are? Is the things that you enact in order to accomplish goals? Um, so we did a study. We come up with a bunch of goals. Here's the definition of extroversion. So the question is, what goals would you have when you would act those ways? What goals would, would those things be facilitatory towards accomplishing? So why would you have be talkative? Well, I guess if you wanted to convey information to someone, that would be a good time to do it. A good thing to do, be talkative. <laughs> Not so good to be silent. Or maybe if you wanted to entertain someone. When would you be adventurous? Eh, maybe you wanted to shake things up, right? Maybe um, that would, might be a goal. It's hard. It's actually it took us a while to come up with these goals. What are the goals that these things are good for? We, we had many team meetings. We went through a bunch. We came up with a bunch of goals. Um, we, sometimes we get them wrong, it turns out, empirically. But this was, in this study, we had uh, 18 of them. And we predicted how extroverted people acted from what goal they had at the moment. 
and did an experience sampling study. And so this is, this is a version of what Aranda showed you. And actually, he showed, his point was actually, he showed you data that aren't as convincing as most of the data <laughs> uh, <laughs> that we find. Because for example, <laughs> Because he, he's, he's fair and he's not going to you know, do any p-hacking or anything like that. <laughs> um, so here's, a, here's this, this particular study. This is the within-person variance. This is how much people differ from themselves and how extroverted they are from moment to moment. And this is how much people differ from each other. <laughs> right? in, this, in this study, it's massively more variance. You know, you're much more like other people than you are like yourself. So uh, the question is, how much of this change in extroversion from moment to moment is explained by these goals people are predicting? What percentage of this? And it turns out it's almost all of it. Almost all of the differences between how extroverted a person's acting at one moment and another are explained by what goals they're trying to accomplish at those moments. And almost all the differences between people and whether they're extroverted or introverted as people is explained by what goals they're trying to accomplish. So, oh yeah, in case you're interested, these are the goals that extroversion is for. See, so we, li I, we like to say that extroversion is for something. Traits are for things. And so what, are, what is extroversion for? It's for connecting with people, entertaining people, having fun, enjoying someone's company, not getting things done. Okay. <laughs> oh, we also just want to show you, it's got nice discriminative validity. So here's a study where we looked at predicting how conscientious people acted. We have eight different goals. And those predict very strongly how conscientious you act, but don't predict how extroverted you are. That's blue. And you get the converse pattern for extroversion. So very clear discrimination here. It's not like people are just saying, oh yeah, I'm accomplishing things and I'm doing things. And they're making very clear discriminations. We did an experiment where we instructed people with a given goal and then looked at whether they acted extroverted and conscientious. Same result. Where are we at in time? Uh, right here, 17 minutes. Oh, we did 15 minutes. Oh, great. Okay. So motives and reasons are powerful causes of the personality states that people enact, right? Self, motivation, belief are, ca are important causes of the traits that people are exhibiting. So it'd be nice now to put this all together. See, can we, can we make one theory of traits that accounts for how it all, all goes together? Tr oftentimes, and not so much in philosophy, but across disciplines, Oftentimes, people use traits as a description of the way people act. It's a term that describes the way people act. That's what traits mean. How are people acting? That's what Aranda showed you. Other times, people use traits, and this is, I think, more, more typical in philosophy, people use traits as accounts of, of explanations of why people act the way they are. And you've got this debate that's been going on for decades uh, about what does a trait really mean? Is it the description? Is it the explanation? We're suggesting that really you can put those together into a whole those are just different parts of the same thing, which is the whole trait. So you got the traits as descriptions and explanations. And then you got the descriptions here, you got the explanations up there. They cause the distributions, and all together, you got the whole trait. And that's what the trait should be conceived of, as this whole thing. We talked about this quite a bit, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what this part is. In this part, this is, the, this is the explanatory part. This is the part that causes the distributions. So what you have going on is you have some kind of input, like a situation, some kind of environmental event. Maybe it's an internal event. Via links, these inputs are linked to intermediates. These intermediates can be other environmental events, other internal events. They can be interpretations of the situation. They can be activation of goals. They can be initiation of homeostatic forces. There's a variety of things. That really importantly, these are all linked together, because this is where everything happens. This is where all of the, the, the beliefs come in, the motivations, the reasons, responsiveness. This is where all that's going on. Right? Then those links lead to the output, which is a personality state for the moment. And you can see that's what these lines are indicating. Different points are going to be at different parts of the distribution, depending on how all these intermediates interact with each other to lead to the state you're going to have at the moment. Any, any questions or comments? Importantly, you're going to have individual differences in those links. People are going to differ from each other in how situations are interpreted, and then what those interpretations lead to, what goals people have as a result of those interpretations, and so forth. And then they're going to differ in how those intermediates link to given personality states. So you're going to have individual differences up there, which are going to 
Oh, also you're gonna have individual differences in situations people are in, of course. Those individual differences are going to explain the individual differences down here. That's the claim. So one example, goal for pursuit, you go in a goal affording situation, um, you're at a talk, and you wanna convey some information to some people, that links some things, oh, I should probably prepare a talk. So you do that, right? And then you get in front of people and you're like, I have to talk and I have to be, keep them from falling asleep at eight in the morning. So I'll probably be a little more extroverted and so I end up having an extroverted state for the moment. Notice I wanna comment on what happened to traits here briefly. Well, first traits went from an entity, a single entity, to a collection. Most models of, I, I sometimes very derisively speak of some theories of trait models is the sphere model. They're sort of like these spheres that are unanalyzable, that are inside, that emit behaviors. Single entities, Co not you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So what we've done is we've turned traits into, oops, we've turned traits into collections now. They're collections of beliefs, motivations, self-concepts, identities, and various things. They're all interacting together. Traits are not something you have, but something you do in order to accomplish goals. And we've, s almost every, there's some important exceptions, such as Colin, but almost, most theories of personality have traits, motivations, self, beliefs, as separate domains that are somehow vaguely connected to each other, but it's not clear yet. This says, no, these are not, traits are not distinct domains of personality or, or psychology, but they're actually, traits are inclusive of those domains. You had, to, you had to change traits completely, you had to get rid of the entities in order to make that happen, right? You had to make traits much more of a collection and doing to make that happen, but that's what this theory does. How does change happen? Well, what happens, so in this theory, personality change happens. It's slow and gradual, but it does happen. The way it happens is, is that your distribution shifts over time. As you start doing different behaviors at different times, you, you, your distribution might become more to the extroverted side, for example. But it changes little behaviors at a time. And how does it happen in here? Well, it all comes back to the fact that states have consequences. So when you enact different states, you have different consequences. People notice those consequences, so they go back, you know, sort of through basic learning pr principles, they go back and influence those links. So people have different links when they realize that, oh, every time I'm rude to this person, I end up having, feeling terrible and getting people mad at me. I think I'm gonna stop being so rude to people, right? And so they learn, next time when someone says something not so nice to me, I'm gonna make a joke or something instead of respond aggressively. And so they learn these links. And th these links, of course, feed each other too. So these little arrows mean that there's also change going on within the links as well. So that's how change happens up there. So, does it work for the virtues? Um, we think it does, for various reasons. Um, but let me talk about some reasons, first start with the reasons why it might not work. So uh, Lorraine Besser Jones suggested, for example, that the whole trait theory might not work for the virtues for at least three reasons. One of which was is that motivations and beliefs are key to virtues, while traits are more descriptive of behaviors. The second is, is that virtues are aspirational we have tried to become more virtuous, where we don't try to become more extroverted. And virtues are voluntary, um, that uh, according to her argument, that traits are things that are caused by genes and environment, while uh, virtues are things that you, we have voluntary control over. And then Doris uh, says that uh, this won't work, this kind of model, he doesn't directly address whole trait theory, but he addresses the aggregation, which is the key part there, won't work for uh, virtues because virtues can't allow exceptions. Um, distributions do allow exceptions. So therefore, distributions can't be the basis of virtue, in a nutshell. So we did some studies with virtues to see if the basic empirical pattern holds up, and it does. So we took compassion, courage, and fairness, and we found that in fact, people do vary over time within person over how courageous they are, how fair they are, and how compassionate they are. Oh, yeah, you can get bigger pictures of this. And then, but nonetheless, people have different averages, average degrees of, in this case, fairness, 
And those averages are extremely stable, just as Aranda showed from week to week. So for example, here's a little, here's a guy right here whose fairness, wow, sorry. Is it, why does it get louder when I come over here? Uh, whose fairness was around 60 in the first week and was around 60 in the second week. And this correlation is, these correlations are 0.6 to 0.9 very, very high. People are stay very much in the same place in the virtues from, moment, from week to week in how virtuous they are. So what you end up with is these distributions. So you end up with, for example, the compassionate person over here who, yeah, varies and sometimes does some things that we wouldn't really necessarily call compassionate, but most of the time they're over here. And, you know, they vary for probably reasonable reasons, right? Situations change, demands of situations change, motivations change. What, what is the correct behavior changes from moment to moment, they're responsive to that. And then you've got the person who's not so compassionate whose distribution is shifted to the left. Right? And so that, we get the same pattern here. Secondly, because whole trait theory is not limited to those behaviors, but it includes specifically all of these uh, explanatory links that where the, process, the motivations, the beliefs, and the, the goals, and so on are happening, that we actually are dealing with all of those entities that are so important to virtue. They're what are causing the descriptions of the, of the fairness. In fact, and it's these distributions that make it necessary to have things like that. Because people are varying, we need to have an explanation that, it, that invokes things like motivations and beliefs and situations and so on. In fact, this is where we would claim that practical reasoning is occurring, is in this section. The practical reasoning that is the behind virtues here. What about extremely vicious behaviors? So Doris's argument is that distributions allow extremely vicious behaviors, but no, no, ma no, no number of compassionate behaviors make up for one extremely vicious behavior. So he uses lurid examples like, you know, molesting your ch babysitter, molesting your children, or you come home and your best friend and your spouse are up to something, um, or someone murders someone, so very lurid examples. He says if you do one of those, it disqualifies the whole li rest of your life of compassionate. You, you can't call that person virtuous anymore, okay? We'll, we'll grant him that, probably could question that. The key question, so yeah, I'll give you this example here. So for example, a highly uncompassionate, this is a person who we would, might call virtuous, uncompassionate, maybe, maybe not, but at least they're more virtuous, more compassionate than others. Uh, we take one highly uncompassionate behavior, a murder, right? So the scale is the most least compassionate, most compassionate. If that person, <laughs> in our paper, in the paper that we, we elaborate this, we use we actually use the, the most about the five worst, and then we use the next. 20 worth and so on to, to, to address that exact issue. <laughs> and the idea is, is that if this person does one murder, that totally disqualifies their distributions counting as virtue. But the distribution would allow that. So therefore, distributions can't be the basis of virtues. And that's the argument. We're going to take issue with whether the distribution allows that. His whole basis of the argument is, is, the, is, the, is the claim, I mean, is the, is the empirical fact that your average only predicts your single behaviors at the 0.20 level. So this is an appear, yeah, five minutes, is that what that said? Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, the, 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 whole, the, 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 the empirical fact that this, this average predicts single behaviors only at the 0.20 level. And, and so therefore you can't predict very strongly whether a person who's very compassionate would act in a murderous or heinous way. And that, it may not matter for something like extroversion, Right, if someone is highly extroverted and they one time do this extremely introverted behavior, I'm not sure what that would be, but if they do that one time, that's not gonna disqualify the rest of their extroversion. But for virtues, it does. So it might work fine for, for normal traits, it doesn't work for virtues because of that 0.20 correlation, that weak prediction. And what we're gonna, the, the, the counter argument that we're gonna make is that this distributions do not allow those behaviors. Even though the correlation is correctly only 0.2 between averages, and single behaviors, not all single behaviors are alike. And extremely vicious behaviors are very strongly negatively predicted from high averages. So the way we did this is we made a bunch of artificial people. Um, <laughs> we did this in SPSS. The nice thing about artificial people is you can make sure the only thing that is affecting your data are the, the, the assumptions that you put into it. 
And that's the only thing affecting your data. So we can control the assumptions. And secondly, anybody can repeat this and get the same results. There's no question about like any kind of me doing this or Rhonda doing this. So we made a bunch of artificial people. We made 10,000 of them. And we, what we did is we all gave, we gave them um, an average level of compassion that went from four to negative four. So people down here are people who are extremely vicious on average. People up here are extremely virtuous on average. People who are here in the middle on average. Okay. <laughs> um, and then we had them randomly do one action that varied in how compassionate it was. And the only, we made that constraint randomly, that, that, that scenario, we made that single action randomly distributed with only one constraint on it, that it was predicted 0.2 from their average level, right? The 0.2 correlation that's so fundamental. So that's the only constraint on that action. Otherwise, it could be anywhere. It could be extremely vicious or extremely compassionate. It just had to be correlated 0.2 with their average level. And that's how you get this scatter plot. So you end up with a bunch of actions that are very low in compassion. See, negative, negative 3, this is how compassionate the single action is. Goes from negative 3 to like negative 6.5. These little dots are single actions. Those are the worst ones. Those are the ones that are very uncompassionate. The question is, is it the people that are highly compassionate that do those actions? And you can already see that it's not, right? That this, this area here, which would be compassionate people doing uncompassionate actions, it would be a region of disqualification for counting as compassionate, is empty. Right? There aren't any people that have a high aggregate, that are very virtuous, that are doing the heinous disqualifying action. Now, we've run these simulations many, many times. Every once in a while, you get a dot in there. <laughs> right? So it's not perfect. Right? There is going to be occasionally a person who's highly compassionate who does something horrid. But that's going to be very, very rare. And, and almost, you, you have to do a lot of these simulations before you get one of those people. So we think that, in fact, distributions do not allow for the single heinous uh, except, uh, action that disqualifies the distribution of the highly compassionate, potentially virtuous person. Um, so in conclusion, we think whole trait theory does work for the virtues, works for regular traits. The distribution reveals strong prediction of behavior from broad character traits. It accounts for the powerful effects of situations within those wide distributions. It provides that necessary machinery to include the motivations, the, the beliefs, the self for the behaviors, the subtle complex calculations required of an Aristotelian virtue. Required, it has the room for that. And we only had 45 minutes, so we can only scratch the surface of this. Hopefully you'll read more or ask questions. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. That was a great pair of talks, guys. Thanks a lot. I've, uh, as you know, I've been very intrigued by this for a long time and have read some of the textual sources. I have some more reading to do. Um, but the, what, what really intrigued me the most today was your discussion of intentionality and goals as really an explanatory factor uh, for traits. And, and there are other explanatory factors you described. But in some ways, I guess what I was moving toward is thinking about, are you suggesting that one way to think about traits is uh, really kind of a set of characteristic intentions or goals. So in other words, we have this distribution of trait behaviors that seem to be at least partly driven by intentions or goals. Could we say that extroverts tend to have extroverted goals, yeah. and that's what makes them extroverts? Um, compassionate people have compassionate goals, and that's what makes them compassionate. So that's the question I wanted to hear yeah. your thoughts on. Okay, let's see. Should I go? You right ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the strength of your goals would be one of the things that would fit into the intermediates. So uh, some people would, in fact, have the goal of communicating information or of having fun more often than other people. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It seems reasonable. And that, those goals would then make it more likely that they would end up doing extroverted type behaviors. This is for fairness. Uh, they would end up doing uh, more extroverted behaviors. And then people who had those goals less often would make, make them do fewer of these behaviors. But of course, those aren't the only thing in there. There's also the link between the goals and other beliefs. There's a link between the goals and the appropriateness for the situation. There's a link between the goals and the states that people are going to differ on. So that'd be one of the factors mm -hmm. that would determine that. Now, as it turned out in that <laughs> slide, 75% of the difference between people and whether they acted extroverted or not was, in fact, 
just the strength of the, the frequency of the gold for them. So that might be the most powerful predictor. That's to be determined. Darsha, so I'm sorry. Do, I'll, I'm going to accidentally, because you know, our tr we have different things. So I'm going to accidentally call on people. Just you correct me if I do it wrong. All righty then. <laughs> uh, Darsha, Paul, Howard, and uh, John, thank you very much for these talks. Uh, very intriguing and uh, stimulating. Uh, question on methodology. Um, I think uh, um, you have self-reports right here. You're giving them adjectives to respond to or something, right, uh, experientially. Um, and I'm just thinking about Donald Trump. He'd probably <laughs> interpret himself as compassionate, fair, just, et cetera, et cetera. So how are you controlling for, <laughs> hugely, yes, uh, <laughs> are you controlling for narcissism and social desirability and things of, you know, they're filtering their own, I mean, you're, you're getting their perceptions, not an objective perception of their behavior or um, virtue. Yeah. First, I'll talk about this study, then you can talk yeah. about the other one. Th right. In this study where we, we looked at the consistency of fairness, compassion, and courage, I wanna, there's a couple of key things to point out here. One is, is that people are clustered towards the top, but people have quite a bit of differences in their self-ratings of how fair, cur courageous, and compassionate they are. People are willing to say, I'm not being fair. So they're willing to say that. And, and secondly, then, there's a high consistency across time, and this is, in fact, controlling for social desirability. Now, that's not the greatest method. I, Social desirability is poorly measured, so that's not enough. But it's it's all it's already intriguing positive evidence. Um, other people like Taya Cohen have shown that, you know, if you think you're fair, people you work with also think you're fair. If you think you're compassionate, people you work with think you're fa compassionate. Work that we've done has shown that, like, if you think you're fair, your boss will think you're fair, your college friends will think you're fair, your parents will think you're fair. And if you think you're not fair, your boss will think you're not fair. Your college friends will think you're not fair, and your mom will think you're not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so we've shown that it works across different domains and things like that. It's not huge correlations, but it's definitely there's some validity there. It's also true that when you ask people about their behavior over a short time period, like over 15 minutes, people are less likely to be susceptible to bias, right? So when you ask people about their trait, then the people are perhaps more likely to inflate their ratings. But when you ask people about their behavior over a shorter time period, over 15 minutes or so, people are less likely to inflate their ratings because they're more likely to just think about their last 15 minutes and they don't, it's likely they're less likely, they're, they're not gonna think, well, this is indicated by character, just describing their behavior. So they're more likely to give you a more honest answer. And in the study that Rhonda talked about where we put people in situations, it, that was in uh, actually in rooms with one-way mirrors and people were watching behind them and those ratings are very highly correlated mm -hmm. with how, what they say they're acting. Those are normal traits, not, not virtues, but they're, they are highly correlated. Paul. I'm so sorry. Yeah, Colin, <laughs> I beg your pardon. Yes, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, can, I can see how this is going to go. <laughs> so, well, I mean, uh, you, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm not surprised that the goals that people have explain a lot of the behaviors that they're enacting at any given time. Of course not. Uh, but I guess what it seems to me is that you're describing that as the explanation for traits. Now, I agree that it's the explanation for specific behaviors. Um, but the traits refer to these regularities that people have over time. And in order to have regularities in their behaviors, th this would suggest they also have these regularities in their goals. So it seems to me that in a way, you're just pushing the need for explanation uh, back another step. Right? Because now we need to understand why people have different uh, consistent patterns of motivations and goals over time. Right? So there's still something that we need to know about uh, that say, like, what are, the, what are the causes of these underlying uh, drivers of the behavior? Do you want to try that or should I? You go ahead. Um, so the question is, are we just pushing it back a step? Uh, uh, and, I, and I think clearly not uh, for several reasons. One is that, uh, I mean, well, and clearly yes, both, right? So on the one hand, the relationship between traits and motivations has mystified personality psychologists for a century. <laughs> not all of us. <laughs> yes, not the brilliant. No, no, no. I mean, going back, you know, 50 years, Alford, Gray, Pelligan. We can talk about that. 
Uh, so 100 years ago, for example, Alport and Murray were constantly fighting with each other with what is the relationship between motives and, and traits. And currently, if you look at, say, the five like models of personality that are out, that are talked about frequently, I think is not talked about that frequently, but they always have them in these separate domains. And so, very least, so the first step is we're turning it from two things that need to be explained, motives and traits, into one thing, right? Because we're putting them together. And so that's, a, that's a, an improvement. Secondly, we're saying how they're linked specifically. And third, third, we change the character of this. This is no longer just a sort of a way you're acting or just a habit or just a thing that comes out of nowhere, but it's actually intentional. So that these actions that we're people are doing are actually for a purpose. They're not just the way you are or just some sort of habit. You just, you're just talking because that's who you are, but you're actually trying to do something with them. So we, these have become means to ends. And then fourth, this is a different kind of thing up here. These, these goals, and that's sort of partly my reason in, in response to Blaine, these goals up here are not just five sort of thing, five ways of acting, but are much more complex. These are much harder. There's many more of these. They're all inter they're smaller. They're all interacting with each other in very complex ways. So it's a very different thing to be explaining these than to be explaining those. So those are some of the reasons why I don't think it's just. But of course, right? We're saying to understand this, you have to understand this. So the next, so step two, understand this. Right. And that yeah. was my question. Yeah. Where do the regularities come from in those two? Exactly. Yeah. We do say that where they come from is way back there with the consequences. So this is also a very different model than your common trait model. So we're saying that the lear there's a, this is really a lot of learning going on here. There's a lot of reason going on here. So that because these states have consequences, if you focus on the consequences, which is what trait theorists have not done, what you find then is, is that, of course, people are going to then think about those consequences. And they're going to try to change the way they act and how they interpret situations to maximize those consequences, which makes for a very different source of those goals and the links between those goals than you might look for of elsewhere. For example, the gene for extroversion. This, this model says there's no point in doing that. Not but, that people do that. The of the yeah, because you're going to find, which is what the gene-wide association studies show, is that you're going to find thousands of genes right. yeah. that are all interacting with each other in very small ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hey, Howard. Um, so I not being a social psychologist or a personality psychologist, being a cognitive psychologist, this resonates well anytime you frame changes in personality in the context of learning, reinforcement, sets of goals, values, et cetera. Seems like a, a, a good move conceptually. It's certainly consistent with the way we've been thinking about wise behavior instead of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So wisdom yeah. now, uh, accretes to the mean of the distribution of wise behaviors on some, uh, on some dimension. So that's, that's all well and good, and it's certainly consistent with the way we've interpreted Valerie's, uh, Valerie's thinking about wisdom, except for one thing which you, you did have a kind of little feedback loop that was labeled there, but the framing of, uh, not, and not in this okay. slide, I don't know which one, um, but uh, what I'm going to is this that much of the description here is propositional in its structure. That is, you have goals and states and consequences and so forth, and not procedural. And so one of the things that I'm interested in thinking about is where reflection comes in in some of these situations, where action comes in, mm. where reflection has not, so uh, Valerie distinguished reflectable versus reflecting on something, things, Things like that, how, uh, you, you can have a goal which explains a purported trait, but if you're not effective in making use of behavioral repertoires that lead to consequences that achieve the goal in the way that are consistent with your value commitments, mm -hmm. then you get a disconnect between what you're calling sort of the goal driving the trait and the manifestation of the trait potentially. And so I'm interested in your thinking about that. Yeah, so these arrows that are the smallest, might be the most interesting or important to me because I think that's where the reflecting is. Right here is where, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, so after you have the consequences, it goes back and affects the links, and then you reflect on these links. You reflect about how, why did I act this way and how does that fit with some other belief that I have. So even though these arrows are really small, they're supposed to re re reflect, be reflecting. 
uh, if I'm using the terminology correctly. <laughs> um, and so these things here, like the goals, would be the things that you're reflecting upon, right? And they're they're a little less uh, involved in the reflection. So the the question is maybe not reflecting on the goal, but the way of achieving the goal. So the question here is yeah. reflection can operate if you can assess correctly the relationship between what you did and what happened. You can have the goal and you can have mm -hmm. the outcome and an association just form between those. But if your right. understanding of the action choices that you make right. not yeah. well coupled in that situation, you won't read the behavior change. So, so you're reflecting we on the pathway, as it were. Right. You should reflect, yeah, so this, there should be a pathway here where you're, a yellow line mm -hmm. where you're reflecting on these lines here. Maybe, something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's or nice, yeah. Or also that. thinking yeah. that there are two levels at which reinforcement may occur. Reinforcement may occur by cognizing about the situation. Reinforcement may occur just because of the association. Right? So those are different kinds of yeah. mechanisms underlying the goal. Can I just like say one thing to Colin, and that is that I just want to say that Colin and I have a we've been de debating quite a bit. We have a lot. We, we we actually have very similar theories of personality. It's very small differences that, that we yes that we really focus on. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So thank you. <laughs> uh, I, uh, it's very interesting and, and resonates a lot of with a lot of stuff in Buddhist theory. That's kind of my world. But uh, a question for you, which would also in the Buddhist context be very important is that there can be a distinction between overt reported goals and covert actual goals. Mm -hmm. And that the covert actual goals are in fact predictive of behavior if you can somehow dig them out. And the overt goals are not predictive of behavior. They're predictive of discourse, essentially, and self-description. So I'm just wondering if you've had, you have some way of distinguishing between those. It, my impression is it's you know, self-reported goals and I'm just wondering whether that, that sounds like we're just dealing with overt explicit goals that uh, could be susceptible to a number of factors such as social desirability. So could I guess it's kind of a, uh, uh, in some ways, a corollary of Darsh's question. Could you give an example of a covert goal in your mind? I'm asking this question because I want to inquire into your theory, but actually mm -hmm. I'm doing it just to show off. Right. <laughs> but that's usually that's in academic settings that's not very covert. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a related way this works is that then the implication would be what you really need to do are to work with people's covert goals, mm. which means that getting them into behavioral situations in which their covert goals change, forcing them even to behave in ways that make their covert, covert goals change is what leads to trait change. Yeah. So that was the reason we did the experiment, is where we assigned the goal ahead of time and then saw how they acted in the next 45 minutes. So that way we know that the, the, the overt goal could not have been an after-the-fact yeah. story that they told just to justify their action. Yeah, that wasn't pretty accurate. Yeah, I mm -hmm. went really quick over that experiment, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that was, and that, you're absolutely right, it could be that mm -hmm. they're just making those goals up after the actions, and that's why we had to do the experiment. Mm -hmm. We've done a couple experiments. So you, you feel great confidence that you have sorted out Oh, no, 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 absolutely. This is, we're just starting to look at the motivations that are predictive of the behavior states. And, and the covert goals are surely very powerful, absolutely. And I'm talking about the Buddhist thing, so uh, I was, at, I guess we're out of time, so let me just say one little story. I gave a talk at a Buddhist center in, in, the, in the Triangle of North Carolina, and uh, it was really interesting because I got invited to do that talk. People have very often told us that this theory is very Buddhist. And, uh, and then uh, I think there was one more coincidence. And so I concluded at this talk that God is trying to tell me something. <laughs> <laughs>